starting from this video, we will start to talk about uh, seismic, uh, seismic data processing and interpretation uh, inside of Patrol. Um, Patrol actually has a very strong capability for, for processing and uh, visualizing and also um, visualizing seismic data. And uh, it also provides the capability for us to uh, make interpretations. So, um, so in the previous videos, we have actually went through from stratigraphy to structural modeling and then to property modeling, right? Um, we have looked at uh, some of the buttons inside of those different ribbons. And for seismic interpretation, uh, the buttons that's in this seismic interpretation ribbon are going to be useful. That's one of the things that we may need to pay attention to when we uh, sort of look at the seismic data. So seismic interpretation, that's this tab. This tab is going to be useful. And then depending upon the context, if we have a seismic data that's inside of our input pane, uh, and if it's highlighted, if it's selected, then we may see a seismic context-aware tab that appears at this particular location. And if we click on it, it's going to give us a a collection of buttons to, to, to work with. Um, so so let's let's um, all those uh, windows that, that we have opened up so far are for previous uh, videos. So let's uh, close at least some of them so that we can actually uh, re reuse many of the figures to to display the seismic data. <coughs> Those those figures are still are still uh, are still in the in, inside of the window. If we want to get them back, we can always do that. It's not like uh, they're deleted. The data associated with them are actually stored. So uh, if we want to get them back, it's uh, it's actually quite easy to do. So all those windows should be here, right? Those are all the windows. Um, some of the calculations from previous uh, from from previous um, uncertainty tests. Right? These folders are not exactly useful. We can just delete them. So in order to actually import seismic data, the first thing we need to do is to, in, in, to, to insert a, a folder called a seismic main folder. And it's inside of this uh, home tab under, underneath the home ribbon. Right? We, have, we have this folder. And then the first thing we need to do is to actually insert the new seismic main folder. It's just like the new wheel folder. Right? Every project can have just a one seismic main folder. Right. <clears throat> so for this particular project, we already have a one main wheel folder. So the new wheel folder item is uh, grayed out. So we cannot create a new wheel folder anymore. <clears throat> so if we click on new main seismic main folder, we're going to get a seismic folder here. Right. And if we go back, this new seismic main folder has grayed out. So we cannot actually insert a second seismic, uh, new seismic main folder anymore. And inside of this uh, seismic, seismic main folder, we have um, some subfolders, right? For example, the interpretation folder one. So later on, if we have interpretation data, we can sort of put them in there. And then we have vintages, uh, interp survey inclusion filters, those things, right? Um, those things are uh, important, but uh, we will not look at them right now. The first thing we're gonna, the next thing we're gonna do is to actually create a survey. So the next thing we need to create is a survey. So again, let's go back to the folder. So when we actually input the seismic data, the the SIGY files, those SIGY files are not sort of stored in the seismic main folder directly. It's actually stored in a survey. 
So in the Sodwig main folder, you can have multiple surveys. And for each of the survey, you can have multiple seismic data. So, so some of the surveys, some of the survey may 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 have uh, collected a three-dimensional seismic data. But some of the survey survey may have just uh, collected two-dimensional uh, seismic data, and some of the survey may have collected both two-dimensional uh, two two-dimensional two survey lines and also three-dimensional seismic data. Uh, all those uh, all those different kinds of seismic data can be organized into different survey folders. So, so the first thing we're gonna, the next thing we're going to do is to actually create a insert a new seismic survey. This button, right? And this button can be created. Uh, we can have multiple ones, right? New seismic. We have like survey one, survey two. Depending upon how many surveys we have for this particular project, we can we can insert as many surveys as needed. But for now, let's uh, let's just use one survey. Let's delete. Let's delete uh, that survey two and three. So now we have an empty survey folder, and you can sort of see there's a small red question mark on the folder uh, icon, right? So now let's try to import the seismic data. So again, right click on the survey, the survey folder, and then we can just uh, import on selection, right? So import on selection. Um, and then we have our seismic data is stored in this particular folder, seismic data. And then we have um, some, some example data sets. But the one that we're going to uh, use is this one, ST8511R92SGY. So SGY, dot SGY is a, more, is a, is a shorthand notation for S SEGY. It's a pr pretty much the same thing. SEGY is some kind of standard format for storing uh, active source seismic data that's collected uh, for uh, in, in exploration seismology. So it's a it's a very widely used seismic data format, and uh, it's used for storing not just the seismic data but also, for example, uh, uh, GPR data. So so uh, yes, other kinds of data that's kind of related to uh, exploration. Um, and then the file format. It has to be SegWi. Uh, yeah, it's just a uh, SegWi seismic data. Let's just use this one. All right. Um, yeah, and then we can just click on open. So it's it's telling us that uh, this SegWi file has uh, inconsistent trace headers. This may be due to a corrupted file or traces of varying lengths, that kind of thing. Do you want to try loading only the undamaged part? This will not always work. It's okay. We can just click on yes because uh, uh, for this particular SQLite file, it's actually it's supposed to be a three dimensional uh, three dimensional seismic data. It's supposed to be a three dimensional cube actually, but uh, some portions, uh, some uh, a corner of that cube is actually missing. So, but it's okay. Let's click on yes. It's, it, it actually happens in the field quite often, just because uh, uh, just because uh, some of the regions are kind of uh, uh, out of the range of the s survey, right? So it's uh, not so easy to actually put the equipment in those regions. So sometimes the well, we would like to actually collect a three-dimensional cube, but sometimes some of the corners of the survey area is uh, out of uh, out of reach. And then we're just gonna so the name can be a different a different name. Right. So now ST eighty five eleven R ninety two is like the default default name because it's the name of the file. The SegWi file has this name, so the file name was used as some kind of default name. But if you don't like it, you can sort of change it to anything else. Um, let's just okay, so say the three D seismic. Uh, seismic raw data. Right. Let's just uh, say Give some uh, type is really seismic, and then the template is fine. It's seismic default, right? And the domain for seismic data, it's usually just the two two kinds of domain: either elevation time or elevation depth, right? For this raw data, it's uh, elevation time, right? Because the vertical axis is actually time in milliseconds, basically. And then vintage. So vintage is um is a word that's borrowed from the wine 
industry, right? So for different kinds of wine, they actually classify them according to vintage, right? Salzburg data is the 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 word vintage here used in, to represent Salzburg data is kind of a um uh, it's it's just another an, another way for us to actually uh, classify Salzburg data basically. You can you can um, depending upon the convention in your company or depending upon the your own preference, you could actually use vintage this particular field to store different kinds of um, information that can be used used to 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 give some indication about what the seismic data actually is, what this seismic actually uh, seismic data actually is. Right. Uh, let's let's create a new one. Let's just call it amplitude. You can you can you can give it any name. It doesn't have to be amplitude. It can be um, other words. Right? It doesn't really matter as long as it makes sense to you. Then project CRS is uh, ED50 UTM31. That's the project uh, CRS that we selected at the beginning of the project. And then the file CRS. It's supposed to be the same one. So let's just use the same CRS coordinate system. And then this basically this box this part of the dialog box gives us some indication about the range of the data x range y range and then z range z range is actually in, in terms of milliseconds x y and y range are in meters that's cross line and in line um, coordinates basically and then z range goes from minus twenty three zero three point six eight millisecond to minus thirteen ninety five milliseconds and then unit conversion do we want to do unit conversion xy conversion we don't need to do any kind of xy conversion because it's already in meters that the project unit and for the z conversion we prove we 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 usually don't want to do that actually if it's milliseconds that's um that's uh that's already kind of in, in the in the in the correct unit right but, but but if it's in seconds if it's in seconds then we may want to do this second to millisecond conversion, right? But for now, let's just choose um, none. Um, and then let's just click on OK. And then the survey folder has a data in it. And uh, the question mark on the folder icon has disappeared, right? And now we have uh, the 3D seismic raw data. And by default, it's going to insert two cross sections into the, this three dimensional seismic cube right so let's 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 uh, create a three dimensional window and then 3d window and then let's display this uh, this seismic raw data so if you just click on the volume the 3d seismic raw data if you click on the volume or click on the survey right either either case then what you're going to see is actually the inline and the cross line. Those are survey lines. Those survey lines. Those so seismic data are actually gathered along the so seismic instruments and the shots and the receivers. Those shots and the receivers are actually located al along those inlines and the cross lines. And then the grid that's being plotted here is just a selection of those inline and cross lines. So IAO means inline. XAO means cross line. So here, the first one that's being plotted is uh, inline 152. And then the next one is inline 352. So it's a 200 cross lines, uh, 200 inlines, right? 200 inlines in this particular direction. And then this cross line 150, cross line 350, again, 200 lines, right? So if we just uh, visualize the survey or the 3D seismic data, raw, raw data, all we are seeing is this kind of an inline and a cross line, this kind of a mesh or this kind of grid on which the seismic data was collected. If we really want to see the amplitude of the seismic data, we have to sort of display, click on these two checkboxes. And then at this point, it's going to display inline 526 and a cross line 450. So by default, this inline and a cross line that's automatically inserted by patrol are going to appear sort of in the middle, sort of in the middle of the inline and the cross line the, 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 in the middle of the of the three-dimensional cube right so inline 526 is about in the middle of the entire inline range right and then 
cross line 450 is about in the middle of the cross entire cross line range. If we want to see the data, we can just uh, rotate the cube so we can see the data. So by now we have successfully imported the data into our uh, volume, uh, into our project, right? And then, and then we have um, we have two uh, we have two lines, two, uh, two one inline and one cross line that allows us to examine the seismic data. Right? So if the inline and the cross line uh, is not exactly at the location that you want them to be. There's a very easy easy way for you to actually make adjustments, which is by by clicking on this button called Manipulate Plane, and it's got a sh keyboard shortcut that's M. If you click on it, and then you can drag on any of the inline and cross line that's already created by uh, created by by Patrol. And as you actually move the inline and cross line, you're gonna see some regions that's gray. Those are the regions where you don't have seismic data. You don't have seismic data. Right. So you can quickly scan or quickly browse the data and try to find out what's actually the extent of the regions that you have data and the, what, what's actually the regions where you don't have complete data sets. And then if you want to go back to the viewing mode, all you have to do is to actually click on this little hand, or just by using the keyboard shortcut V. Right? And then you can go back to the viewing mode to look at the, to look at the cross sections from different angles. And sometimes you would like to actually also insert a time slice. So these two these two cross sections, the inline and the cross line cross sections are vertical. So if you would like to add a horizontal slice, you can also do that quite easily. So insert time slice intersection. Right? And this button is also duplicated. So if you look at the context aware tab, that's called a seismic, if you click on it, then here, create intersection, you have a you have a you have a section inside of this ribbon that's just called a create intersection here. You can create inline cross section, inline sections, intersections, cross line intersections, or time slices, right? So you are not sort of confined to the two cross intersections created by Patrol. If you want to add more inline, for example, you can, you can just click on inline, and then you're going to get another inline, right? And again, you can manip manipulate it by moving it around. And so, uh, so you can actually look at the, the inline at different uh, locations or cross line. Right, you can again drag it to the to the to where you want it to be, right? and then time slice. Right, so the time slice is going to allow us to actually look at a horizontal intersection. For some reason, it's not displaying correctly. Oh, now it's uh, coming back. So, uh, if you see this kind of problem, there might be issues with your uh, graphic card, or how the how the how the OpenGL or those kind of graphic configurations are set up on your particular computer, right? I myself are having some trouble when visualizing certain uh, when doing certain kinds of visualizations of seismic data. So, but it's okay. But it's okay. So. Um, so this allows us to actually quickly examine the seismic volume, find out uh, what are the kind of uh, uh, what might be some of the interesting regions, what might be the regions that may have uh, defects, data defects, right? Those regions, so the gray regions. And of course, we can also insert a random line. So maybe I inserted too many inline and cross lines. Let's let, let me delete some of them. Let me delete a cross line and then. Also, uh, no, we cross, delete a one cross line and a one in line. Okay, so this might be better. And then we can also insert random lines, right? Yeah. 
it doesn't have to be a, a intersection that actually sp aligned that's kind of aligned with the inline and the cross line uh, direction so if you insert a random line then you can um so suppose we change the cursor back to the manipulated plan mode and then you can not only just uh, pull the plan back and forth but also you can hold down the control key and rotate the plan right so you can rotate the plan to a specific angle that you would like to actually examine the data So that's sort of a random line, right? And of course, you can create any kind of uh, line or any kind of intersection by using these two buttons. For example, arbitrary polyline, seismic line, and polyline line. Those those uh, those uh, buttons allow you to actually look at the a cross section at any kind of a fence, any kind of three dimensional fence that you draw on the you draw on the on the on the on a polygon using a polygon. That kind of thing and sometimes we would like to actually look at uh, the three-dimensional seismic data on a uh, well section fence for example right so 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 here we have cross sections these two cross sections are actually uh, well fences if we sort of look at one of them oh so so that's where the wheel section actually, uh, wheel fence actually is located, right? So we have like a three wheels on it. Um, suppose we would like to, uh, suppose we would like to actually display seismic data on on this particular plane, on this particular wheel fence. This wheel fence is, um, how do I say, it's pretty straight, right? Do I have a, another one that's kind of curved? Yeah, this one might be better, right? It's a kind of so. Let me let me let me let me use this one for demonstration. So we make this uh, we make this cross section active, and then we have intersection tab, right? And then we can just click on visualization on intersection, right? And then at, once we have clicked on that, lots of the boxes becomes blue. Right, and at this point we can click the blue box in, in front of the 3D seismic raw data, and then we will be able to actually visualize the seismic data on this particular wheel fence. Right. Um, suppose we have another one. Right. Let me. Let me again. Right, so, so, so here we have uh, sort of projected or sort of intersected, uh, interpolated the seismic, 3D seismic data onto these two well section fences. Right? If you have multiple of them, you can just uh, do a similar kind of thing, right? And uh, and we also have um, uh, when we did the well logs, we also have well section windows, right? So can I actually bring one out? A wheel section window, right? We have wheel section windows. So for now, the wheel section window, what's actually being displayed in the background inside of the wheel section window is actually um, the fluvial phases data that we created in our three dimensional model, right? But if we have seismic data, we can try to display the seismic data uh, as the background, right? So here I have clicked on the template setting button, right? And then in here you have background that's through your phases model, right? Um, if we would like to actually display the seismic data as the background, then we can. Uh, so it actually allows you to actually insert the seismic data as the background. So. But for for now, it's not going to work because um, 
because that's because the the wheel the wheel the wheel of data are displayed in the depth domain. It's SSTVD. In, it's in the depth domain, but the seismic data, at least the raw seismic data, it's actually in the time domain. So those seismic data are actually in the time domain, right? So in the in in this kind of a three dimensional view, if you pay attention to to all the buttons or box, boxes here, you're gonna be able to see this box, which has the word any inside of it, right? Which is actually the, this box actually allows you to select the domain. You have two different domains, TVD, that's true vertical depth, or TWT, that's two-way travel time. Right? You can select either one. Right? So, so, so by default, it's going to display any. So, so that's why in this three-dimensional window, we can both see the whale tracks, the whale, whale paths, and also the, the time domain uh, seismic data at the, at the same time. Right, but if you actually switch to two-way travel time, then all the wheel tracks are going to disappear because those wheel track or wheel deviation data are kind of sort of in the in the in the depth domain, right? But if we actually choose the TVD through vertical depths, then all the seismic data is going to disappear. It's not going to be able to actually display the time domain seismic data, right? So if we select any, then we can display both. But for the wheel section window, it cannot do that. In the wheel section window. It can only sort of either display time domain or display depth domain. In fact, if we would like to actually display the seismic data as the background, then we have to actually convert all the log data, where log data into the time domain, and that will require a velocity model for us to actually do that kind of do that kind of conversion, right? But we don't have a velocity model yet, so 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 at at the current stage, we cannot sort of display seismic data as a background. Uh, in, inside of the whale section window. So now let's uh, turn off this visualization on intersection. And then uh, let's just turn off the two intersections also. And then, and then turn off the whales. So let's still put our inline and cross line, and then the time slice, and then a random line on top of our three dimensional. And then there's another more quantitative quantitative way for examining for examining the raw data, right? So which is actually by double click on. Um, let's let's first double click on survey, right? Or right click on survey, and then select the settings. The survey folder, right? So inside of the survey folder, so this style tab allows you to actually specify how many cross line and how many inline grid we want to draw when we actually display the data, right? Suppose uh, for now we are sort of displaying uh, base map annotation. It's called base map annotation. So for now we are drawing every 100 inline and text every 100 inline. And then every 100 cross line, and then every 100 cross line. If we would like to see the survey geometry in a, on a finer grid, we can actually reduce these two numbers. Right. And then we can also adjust the kind of a color and the style of the line. Right. So this this part of the this part of the the dialog box, the style underneath the style tab, just allows us to actually do this kind of configuration to to draw those uh, blue lines to draw those blue grid lines uh, 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 with a different kind of style. Uh, the info tab doesn't really have much uh, uh, useful thing, but if you want to change the survey name, for example, survey one, if you want to change it to some other survey, say 3D survey, something more meaningful, then you can do that here. Statistics. These statistics gives you a table to look at uh, the geometry of the survey and also um, the range of the cross line and the uh, inline geometry, the, the, the coordinates basically. Right. So here, first and first inline x that's giving you a value. That's the UTM in meters, right? And then and first inline y, right? And then and first cross line x and first cross line y, and then origin x, origin y, right? So so 
So these these are actually the UTM coordinates for the bounding box. Right. So you can look at these numbers and compare it and compare them with the information that you have gathered from, for example, the person who have conducted the survey, or uh, just to make sure that the data are in the, the, those data are indeed consistent across your entire project, right? And then how many number of in lines you have? Three hundred seventy-five. How many numbers of cross lines you have? Three hundred and one. The length, the length of it. Uh, interval, right? Interval. Um, so all those information are highly useful for you to actually get a get a get a general understanding about this particular data set that you are actually looking at. And then the, the next one is the geometry. Geometry. So this geometry uh, tab allows you to actually make and make 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 adjustments. So so suppose suppose the numbers that's being displayed here are actually different from from what you know as the ground truth, for example, right? The the the, the information that's uh, uh, provided to you as uh, ground truth, that kind of thing. Then you can make adjustment. So so if if you have inconsistent, which means that maybe maybe the data in the uh, that you imported into patrol may have some kind of error. The geometry of the data may have some kind of error. And at this point, you can sort of make corrections. You can make corrections. So this part is the annotation, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a less important, right? So you can sort of, um, it, it's just going to change how the annotation is going to be displayed here. Uh, lateral geometry, those are lateral geometries. So suppose those numbers are different. Those numbers are different from what you know. Then you can make corrections here. You can make corrections here, right? And then later on, uh, uh, all the all the all the derived data that all the data that's going to be derived from this particular data set and all the interpretation that's going to be done on this particular data set are going to have the correct geometry data right so if you actually make corrections here if there are anything wrong if there are anything wrong with the coordinates for example right you can make corrections here right and then you can also do this kind of translation and rotation right so these two buttons allows you to actually either translate or rotate the entire box in a certain way, right? And you can actually specify the rotation angle, the translation direction, right? You want to translate the whole thing to a certain x and y, right? Uh, to, not to a certain x and y, by by a certain x and y, by x. These these are actual distances. Right? It's not sort of the target uh, coordinate. It's sort of the distance. You want to translate the whole box in the x direction by a certain amount, and then in the y direction by a certain amount. That kind of thing. Um, so all those buttons are highly useful for us to actually check the geometry and then make corrections. And if you would like to explore more, you can move your cursor to the question mark, right? Um, and, and try to find out what's actually the utility of each of the different buttons. Right. Um, um, for now, the quality attributes don't really have uh, much of uh, information inside of it, and uh, usually it's just uh, left empty. If you have more information, you can add them in there. So we're not going to make any changes here in, uh, to the survey. So that's so that. So double click on survey and then look at the settings. That's one of the places for, for you to actually configure, modify, correct, examine all the, the, the geometric data or geometric information associated with this particular survey. And then if there's any kind of problems, you can make corrections there. And then that's, um, let's, double, let's right click on the, on the data volume and then look at the settings. And this time we have Lots of settings actually. We have lots of settings, right, lots of tabs actually, lots of tabs. But uh, the the most useful ones, the, the most useful tab is still the star, uh, style tab, right? And then here you have a base map annotation section that's kind of locked, right? So it's telling you settings are inherited from parent folder. So it means that the settings for this particular, the, the, the base map annotation setting for this three-dimensional seismic volume is actually inherited from the parent folder. 
and the parent folder is actually survey. This survey one folder. So if you click on this lock, you're going to be able to see this base map annotation uh, that's kind of inherited from the survey geometry, right? Uh, so let me see if I can still open the survey setting dialog box. Um, right, that's a, that's a 3D sorting annotation, right? Base map annotation that's specified here. And then you have the same base map annotation that's specified here, right? So, so if you change the base map annotation here, it's going to affect the base map annotation that's going to be displayed here. Right. Suppose we draw every like a uh, uh, twenty lines, right? And then uh, that's twenty line in line, and then twenty line cross line, and then text every one hundred in line, every one hundred cross line. Apply, right? Uh, and then if we so so this clock this lock is locked again, so uh, it's not changed for some reason. But you can sort of see on the map. But you can see on the map now the inline and the cross line are displayed at a much denser uh, grid, right? Or the blue lines, or the blue lines, right? Um, It's not changing, but let me change it maybe to, to 50 or something. Yeah. So so I can change the I can change the, the the base map annotation either by using this part of the settings for the data volume or by using the geometry tab in the service service setting, survey folder setting. Right? And then Underneath the star, we have three tabs, intersection, volume, volume visualization, and annotation. So intersection is going to control how those intersections are going to be displayed, including those inline or cross line or random line or time slice cross sections. All those intersections, how, how they are going to be, how seismic data are going to be displayed on those, uh, on those uh, intersections. For example, you can specify smooth. It's going to make the data look smoother, right? Uh, if you click on none, apply. And then you're going to see seismic data some, somehow pixelated, right? Looks like lots of pixels right next to each other. Right? Bilinear is some kind of linear interpolation. Uh, it's going to smooth the seismic data, right? So it's uh, smoother. And then smooth is uh, some sort of more sophisticated, so more sophisticated sort of smoothing algorithm. But uh, for, it looks like uh, visually there's not too much of a change. Bilinear and smooth are pretty similar, right? And then you have this particular capability called enable bump mapping. So the effect of this uh, bump mapping is that it's going to make the cross section looks like a, uh, looks like those uh, metal plates with those uh, colors that's kind of imprinted on it. It's going to give you some kind of three dimensional uh, illusion, three dimensional illusion. So so that uh, um, the reason that I'm not showing you is because if I click on it and then click on apply, then all my uh, cross sections disappear. Uh, again, it's a graphic problem. So either the graphic card or the software that's going to visualize the graphics is not set up correctly on my machine. But in general, in your machine or on a better machine, it's, uh, it's probably not going to happen. Right? So, so you can try this out. It's going to give you a quite nice three-dimensional effect to look at uh, those. Uh, so, so if you if the enable bump mapping actually works on your machine, you're going to see the the color, the blue and the red color appears like some kind of a, a floating sculpture. It's a sculpted on a on, on the wall, right? It's a it's a kind of a sculpture on the wall, that kind of thing, on a on a metal wall. So, and then you can enable transparency, right? But usually, the transparency don't really work very well. So, so it doesn't actually add any information, but uh, it's not really, uh, it's not either, it's not sort of particularly useful in my work. And then, 
uh, performance, fast seeing movement, which means that when you actually try to actually uh, move data around or do this kind of cross section move, uh, do this kind of rotation or try to actually shift the intersection, that kind of thing, then it's going to enable some kind of a sort of uh, decimation when, while dragging that kind of thing. It's gonna sort of uh, make the calculation faster, so, so the visualization will make the visualization look smoother. And then you have volume visualization, right? So, so this is visualization on intersections, and then you have also volume visualization, right? So if you click on volume wall and then click on apply, then you're gonna be able to see six different sides, right? You're gonna be able to see six sides of the size of the volume. The reason that it's called volume walls instead of volume is because in the inside of it, there's no data, right? It's not sort of filled up with the, it's not filled up with data, data at every grid point in the three-dimensional volume. It's just giving you an illusion about it's a cube, right? Inside of it, it's not filled up with all the data. It just gives, gives you this kind of box, gives you a box with six walls on it so that you can examine the boundaries and how how the data actually appears on the on the six walls, right? So so here you can sort of see where the data is actually missing, right? It's pretty much just the um, this kind of shape in three D, right? Right. So so maybe in the actual survey, it's just that this particular region is blocked out, right? You cannot actually put instruments or put uh, shots in this particular region, right? For some reason, for some reason, either either cultural reasons or political reasons or uh, environmental reasons or any kind of reason, right? so so this part of the data is actually missing. This ha this happens very often in realistic projects. It's not like everywhere is access is uh, completely accessible to seismic survey. And then by now you're going to see volume render is grayed out, right? The reason is because this is a SQL file. And later on, we're going to convert this SQL file into a file format that's called a ZGY. And ZGY is a specific uh, patrol format, patrol seismic data format. Uh, and uh, after that conversion, this volume render part will be, uh, will, will allow us to actually make changes. We will have access to this particular session. Uh, and again, if you hide frame annotation in viewing mode, this um, this is not particularly useful. Uh, sometimes we would actually prefer to uh, look at uh, this um, frame, right? And this, uh, th so, so, um, suppose, suppose I uncheck the survey one and then check random line. So that's going to give us just all the cross sections or intersections, right? That's just going to give us all the intersections. But if you pay attention to the to the check marks in front of the survey one and in front of the 3D seismic raw data, you're going to see differences, right? So the check marks in front of these two things are different from the check marks here, right? So they have some kind of gray on the check mark. But if you actually hard click on it, right? Just click on it again. Then you will be able to see this uh, three three dimensional bounding box, all those inline and cross line and a base map annotation that kind of thing. Right. Right. And then last time I was check uh, clicking on three D seismic data. Now let's let's click on survey one. Oh, it's turned off. So. And this three-dimensional box, this uh, volume wall, this volume wall, this uh, this uh, this uh, this uh, this six sides comes with comes with survey one and seismic data raw data seismic three D seismic raw data. These uh, either the, so so here I have turned turn off the the visualization of the uh, the intersections. So 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 this volume wall is only associated with the survey folder or the volume data or the volume data right if you turn it off then you won't be able to see the wall but if you put it on you will be able to actually see the wall and then you also have annotation but for now let's um, 
it's a it's a quite a simple actually. So by default, it's actually. Um, so is it showing anything more? Because by default, it's already showing those annotations, right? So let's just uh, still put it back. And that's the style tab. That's the style tab. And then you can look at the statistics. Lots of the information is actually duplicated uh, from the from the from the survey from the survey geometry statistics. Okay. But here you have uh, some additional data that's seismic seismic template empty the data. So so it gives you some indication about the range of the data. Um, So inside of the operations, you will be able to actually see a histogram of the all the amplitudes inside of this three-dimensional cube. Right? So every point, every good point inside of this three-dimensional cube actually has an amplitude, right? And then you can make a histogram of it. It shows you the histogram of it. So you see a spike at zero, which means that lots of lots of data points actually has a value that has an amplitude value that's uh, either at zero or very close to zero. Uh, and then it also shows the range, shows you the range, right? And then later on, we are going to use this button to realize. Uh, realize means you want to you are you are converting this raw sequoia data into the ZGY data. That's kind of a patrol specific format, right? And later on, we are going to use this button. Um, sequoia settings. And then geometry, this part is again inherited from the survey. Survey folder, uh, metadata, opacity. For now, opacity is not going to work because it hasn't been realized yet. Right. So, so if you want the opacity to work, you will have to sort of make sure that it's realized. Right. And inside of the inside of the style tab, this volume visualization, this volume render section is uh, turned on. It's not. It's not grayed out. And then opacity is going to work, and then quality attributes is um, also useful. Um, and now let's uh, let's create it, create a two dimensional window. Let's try to create a two. Um, let's create a two dimensional window to to. Uh, And then let's uh, try to actually put the two-dimensional window and the three-dimensional window right next to each other, right? So this is the 3D window. And then inside the 2D window, we will also display this survey, right? So by default, it's going to display all the grid lines, all the inline and the cross lines, right? And then if we have a time slice, it's going to display the time slice, right? This is this is exactly the time slice uh, in the three D window. So maybe it's a good idea to turn off the wall because the wall isn't really working for us. And then just to put on the different lines, basically. So, so, so on this two-dimensional window, this particular view that we are looking at right now is exactly this time slice. So, if we actually look at it from from, from above this way, right. oh, it's not. It's actually not. Uh, What's actually happening here? Let me try to understand. Oh, this one is the is not the it's that's actually at the top. It's actually at the top of the volume, actually, right? That was the top of the volume. So not it's not this particular cross section. It's not it's not the
yeah then this will be the 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 this uh, yeah that, that should be correct way right? for some reason in this uh, two-dimensional window it's it still displays the top of the three-dimensional wall I don't really understand why Yeah, volume wall has turned off, right? So if I just click on survey one, and then Z, then it's gonna give me the correct visualization, I think. So that's the survey, that's the survey box. That's the survey box or the inline and the cross line. And then the random line is this this yellow line, right? This brown line. And then the cross line, that's uh, that brown line. And then this inline. So then let's look at this particular. Detection. And sometimes we would like to actually uh, we would like to actually look at uh, this kind of depth slices on this kind of two dimensional map view, right? And uh, there's a quick way for us to actually link these two things to get together. So, um, so at this stage, we can actually change our cursor into the manipulate plane mode M mode, right? And then we can just drag it, drag this horizontal line. So as we actually move this uh, time slice across all depths on the two-dimensional window, we're going to see changes, right? We're going to see changes how how this time slice actually varies as we actually move or drag this time slice up and down, right? And then try to actually find a good time slice at which we can actually draw, for example, a polygon, right? Draw a polygon on the two-dimensional window. And then that that polygon is going to appear in the three dimensional window, and then we can actually try to actually make interpretations on that uh, cross section, on that particular uh, intersection, that kind of thing. Right. And then uh, if we want to automate this kind of process without us kind of dragging the plan manually, we have a player. So we all, the player is also in the quick access bar. If we click on it then it's going to give us the so-called intersection player that's this button the first button here right and then if we click on it and then it's going to automatically move this particular plane up and down so we can actually see in the two-dimensional window how the time slice actually varies with the with the with the with depth or with the, with time And uh, um, let me still change my cursor back into the uh, viewing mode so I can. Um, so these are some of the basic techniques for visualizing or examining the raw data, right? And then the next thing that we need to do is to actually uh, to actually select the data. The reason for selecting data is uh, first the raw data volume could be huge, right? If you have a very uh, dense seismic data, then the the data volume could be like uh, uh, reaching terabytes, right? These days, you know, re realistic survey, right? But if the region that you are really interested in is only occupies a very small section of it, right? Suppose your project boundary or the simulation boundary is just a very small section of that huge seismic volume you may want to do a clipping or truncation to to select only that small portion inside of your huge seismic volume in that case the total amount of data that you have to sort of look at or try to sort of interpret is going to be a lot smaller and patrol is going to be able to actually visualize that small 
data, smaller data set, much faster, and your interaction with um, that data is going to have a much shorter kind of comeback time, much shorter cycle, right? So, so it's, it's going to improve your efficiency if you clip the data in the right way, right? That's one of the things. And then another thing is that we need to actually uh, convert the data into the ZGY format. The, the ZGY format is kind of optimized format. So it's it's a it's a it's a it's a format that allows Patrol to 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 visualize very quickly. So there are lots of uh, computer science optimizations or computer uh, cache optimizations that allows Patrol to manipulate the ZGY files much faster than a conventional SQL file. Right. So so we will need to go through those two steps. And then we can start to do interpretation, right? And to in order to do interpretation, it's actually quite easy. There are two different ways for uh, for creating for creating a interpretation window. Uh, one is uh, so when you when you are actually examining the data, for example, either by playing time slices or by dragging by dragging those inline and cross lines, that kind of thing. Suppose I change my cursor to this uh, manipulator. So as you actually examine the data, for example, if you found a particular location where you see where you think that you can actually pick the horizons very accurately, right? If uh, if uh, if you have found a particular sort of uh, particular particular location, then you can just uh, right click, right click. Uh, did I choose an inline or cross line? So this is cross line. You can just right click on the cross line, and then it's going to give you a menu option that's called Create Interpretation Window, and then you can click on it. And then this this uh, this uh, X line 358, the one that I just uh, selected, this particular intersection, is going to be displayed as the background in this particular interpretation window, and you can make your interpretation on this particular cross section. Right. right. You can draw on it. You can draw on it, and then uh, do lots of uh, do lots of uh, sort of. Uh, there are lots of operations that's kind of associated with this kind of interpretation, right? But let's close it now. Uh, let's, let's delete it because uh, later on we're going to create a, a more of those. And a second way for, for you to actually create an interpretation window is actually by just going to the Windows menu or quick access button. And then you have an interpretation window here. Right? That's the interpretation window. You can click on it. Right. But now there's nothing on it. Right? But if you, if you actually select a sort of inline 600, if you select this particular inline, then the data is going to be automatically displayed in the middle. Right? You can use your mouse. You can use your mouse to actually zoom in, or hold down the middle button to pan. Right? If you if you have a wheel on the middle button, then the wheel is going to allow you to zoom in and zoom out. And then if you don't have a wheel, you, you can hold down the control and the shift key. Wait until your cursor actually turns into uh, this kind of shape. So the cursor actually turns into this kind of, and then you can drag. Right, drag is going to zoom actually. In this case, right. So let's still close this window, and uh, maybe delete this window. Also. Let me turn my cursor into this little hand. Um, so this is actually a SQL file. It's not the optimized optimized ZGY file. But even for this SQL file, you have a option that could speed up the, the visualization of the data, which is called prefetch to cache, right? used to load seismic data into memory for fast access to the data, right? specify custom cache settings, that kind of thing. If you click on it, then it's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to sort of do some uh, optimizations in terms of the memory, 
so that the visualization of this this particular second Wi-Fi is going to be faster. And then you can also click on it. And next time we're going to look at uh, uh, this particular uh, an option that's called uh, insert virtual cropped volume, right? And then we'll also look at uh, the conversion, converting it to or realization to realize it to realize it into a ZG file file. Okay, so let's stop this video here.